Welcome to Gold Derby. I'm senior editor Denton Davidson here with J.A. Bayona, director of Society of the Snow, Spain's entry for best international feature at the 96th Academy Awards. J.A., you've done a lot in your career, including big Hollywood pictures and, and television shows, some of our favorite horror movies. But here you're going back to Spanish language, representing your country at the Oscars. What does it mean to be selected as Spain's representative and and telling, you know, Spain's story of cinema to me it was great because uh, i've been like for almost 10 years eight years away from home i i shot um a film in hollywood and, a and then i did a tv show in new zealand the lord of the rings tv show uh so go back home uh, to with my people to shoot a movie there was fantastic you know like like i always i always try to to do my films there with my people. Every time I work in Hollywood, I bring my people with me, the, the cinematographer, the um, editors, uh, my producer partner, Elena Tienza, she's been with me since the orphanage. And to me, it's been like a whole journey, like like starting in, in Spain. I did my three first movies in Spain. I did The Orphanage, Impossible, and A Monster Calls. I established my voice. I this, So that was something that I wanted to show the world this is who I am. And then I I, I, I moved to Hollywood. Uh, it was a very interesting experience. But then doing this film after so many years, because we've been trying to do this film for a long time now, but we, we did it now. Uh, um, I think this is where I, where, where I really like to be, you know, like like in, in this position and going back to, to my people with my crew, with my team in my country and being selected for the Oscars was extraordinary to have them the love of your of your colleagues was fantastic. And this story is about the rugby team whose plane crashes in the Andes uh, in 1972. It's a story I'd heard about. Many of us are familiar with some of the gruesome details, you know, the salacious headlines that that we read. But you really made this a human story in a way I've I've never seen it. You gave heart to these men and what they went through in a way I was not familiar with. What made you want to tell this story at, at this time? Well, I was so surprised when I read Pablo Vierti's book because uh, at the opposite of the other um, the other books that were written on the same story, Pablo Vierti's book was written 40 years, almost 40 years after the plane crash. And it was the desire of the survivors to gather together again and tell the story because they couldn't recognize themselves in the story that was in the in the in the minds of the people in the outside. You know, they, they couldn't recognize their story. In, in that story. So they wanted to tell the story again. Um, and it's very interesting because the, that book is a much more um, introspective book. So it's not about the fact, it's about what they went through, the feelings. It's almost like, has almost like a philosophical aspect. And I was so shocked about the human aspect of the book. I was, I found myself reading the book, crying for the people dying in that plane, which is yeah. the first time that happened to me knowing about this story. And then I met the survivors and, and 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 it was even better, you know, like like reading and, and hearing about them, about about the story, meeting them and, and talking about the story with them was extraordinary. And the more I dig into the story, the more I wanted to be involved, because really, I, I think that the, the, the scope of this story in, in terms of the, the spiritual, the, the human side, the philosophical, as I said, is much more bigger than what I thought it was. And it's a drama, but there's still a lot of brilliant technical elements in the film. Can you talk about some of those more difficult things that you did film, such as, you know, what, talk about the plane crash and, and how we see all of the seats sliding into each other and also just the landscape. Where was this film to make it look like you were in the middle of the mountains? I mean, it feels like we're right there. That's that's exactly what we wanted to 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 bring the audience into that plane to go through the experience, to feel empathy, and by 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 sharing the experience, understand what they did, and 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 I think that's something that you can do with film. You know, like this uh, empathy is such a powerful uh, tool that uh, we recently showed a movie to the families of the of the survivors and the families of the victims, and some of them, after 50 years, really understood what they went through. After 50 years, it's a whole life, and watching the film. 
they started to talk about something that was like a taboo for 50 years. They started to gather together again to hug each other. It was so powerful. Uh, and it's because we put the audience into that play and we put the audience into that experience and make them feel what they went through. If you look at the photos of the actual scene and, and what's on your film, it's all it looks identical. I mean, were you were you meticulous? I mean, were you out there like moving every little thing because I, I I couldn't tell the difference, honestly. Yeah, I was obsessed with those pictures. I remember the the the, the, the book alive when I was a kid, and I remember those pictures. They were the only pictures they took in 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 the plane, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's because we I knew the story, I knew the facts, so I was looking more for the details, for the gestures. So basically, what I what I what I did is to prepare the actors as uh, prepare the, give them all the information all the details in order to go through the whole experience with them in chronological order with our cameras ready, like if we were, if we were going to shoot a documentary. And I was looking for those details. I was looking for, I, I became very obsessive in that sense because to me it was less about the fact that I knew and more about the gestures, the performances and, and the details and meaningful details that will reveal the whole story you know especially when you need to reduce 72 days in two hours and a half you really need to get to the essence to find what is really this the story about and you you cast primarily unknown actors from uruguay and argentina how did you go about finding the i mean they're they're brilliant for 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 not having a lot of experience they really pull in the audience with with their emotion. How did you find all of these young men and uh, go through that process? Well, we we did a long long audition, long audition, six months of auditions in a very difficult time because it was during the pandemic. Uh, but then we we did the final auditions in Montevideo. Most of them were coming from Argentina during the pandemic, so they had to stay one week doing quarantine before the auditions and one week more to go back to Argentina. So imagine like a group of almost like 30 young guys in a in a hotel for two weeks. I mean, after the auditions, all of them were already friends. So, and then we we did rehearsals for two months, which is a luxury nowadays to spend seven weeks doing doing rehearsals, going through through throughout all the story. And then uh, I put them in contact with the survivors and, and they spent time together. Um, so they were so well fitted. So they had so much information that the rest of the shoot was to give them the context, you know, like uh, going through the experience in, in, in similar conditions. We shot in the snow in real locations, going through the, the isolation, the cold. They, they, they follow a very strict diet also so so it, it was beautiful to see how the chemistry that i read the the the, the, the camaraderie that i read in the book was the chemistry on the screen that they created a similar society of the snow our own society of the snow during the film what made you decide to tell this through mostly numa's point of view because i i loved that i thought i mean i thought he was that was a really impactful thing for me to to watch his full story unfold what made you decide mm -hmm. this is the character I, we want to sort of see through his lens? I think when I when I was doing all those interviews with the survivors, I realized that they they spent fifty years telling their story, but there were some people who never had the chance to tell the story, which were the ones that stay in the mountains. And then I thought that the essence of the story is to understand that if you survive, I survive. That I will give you everything I have. To allow, if in case of necessary, to allow you to go back home, and 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 in that sense, I thought that would be a very beautiful idea to make the audience follow the same experience. So they start the film with a character, and that character allowed us to experience the ending through other characters, and it was the, the perfect metaphor to tell what was the sacrifice in the mountain, to tell the, the essence of the story, which was to understand that you and I are the same. And just beautiful lessons and and questions uh, that they have throughout the film of of faith and and humanity. And I loved I love one of the last lines. It's um it's just take care of each other. And I think that's a message that that we can all yeah. take away from this film. It's beautiful. Yeah, take care of each other and keep telling the story because at the end, 
this is what we do as filmmakers. We tell stories to find meaning of uh, the meaning of life, to find the, the meaning of reality. And that's the most important thing. This is what the survivors uh, wanted the first time they gather again to, to tell a new book. And this is what we are doing with the film. We are telling, we are keep telling the people uh, what they went through. We are keep, we are telling the story so people will understand what was it. Well, Jay Bayona, thanks for joining our panel today. Good luck with the awards season and congratulations on Society of the Snow. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome to Gold Derby. I'm senior editor Denton Davidson here with Noura Nirasari, director of Sheda, Australia's entry for best international feature at the 96 Academy Awards. Noura, I want to start by asking what it means to be selected to represent Australia this year and Australian cinema, especially on your first feature film. It's it's an incredible honor. And, uh, you know, I never would have imagined that my first film would would be, you know, on the world stage in this way. And, and it's um, it's it's beautiful. It's it's a really beautiful thing. Uh, you know, I I think in terms of Australian cinema, it's. You know, it's rare for Australia to have a nominee. I think I think we've only had one nominee um, and not every year do we have a submission. Um, but, you know, the other thing is that the, usually the nominees, um, sorry, the submissions from Australia are shot overseas, like films that are shot in other countries, like Tana was shot in Vanuatu and, um, you know, Lore and The Rocket and, you know, et cetera. So there's definitely... A, you know, a pattern of um, Australian filmmakers shooting films overseas and then submitting. Uh, but, you know, in the case of Shader, um, it's it's an Australian story um, set set in Australia, but, you know, it, it follows an Iranian mother and daughter who, who are in the pursuit of freedom and starting a new life in a women's shelter. So it, I think it's I think it's a rare situation that um, it's an Australian story, but it's it's uh, centered in a culturally specific world and um at the same time it's it's a very universal story of 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 a woman finding freedom and escaping domestic violence so i feel really proud i feel really proud that 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 you know we're representing australia because it is an australian film and you know um my mother and i wouldn't have found freedom without australia so it's it's a very full circle beautiful moment well, you wrote and produced it as well as directed it. So it's it's quite an undertaking. You know, this was personal for you. Um, you said a lot of this reflects your own childhood. How much of how much of this did you experience? Um, if you if you can share a little bit about what your experience was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I was five years old when uh, my mother and I lived in the women's shelter in Australia and uh, you know, we were there for around eight months, which is longer than most um, most families uh, because of, you know, her lack of residency status and a uh, myriad of other things, not having family, not knowing the language, you know, really being, um, you know, incredibly alone and displaced um, in this country. And uh, that that experience always stayed with me because of the of the warmth of the women in the shelter. Um, it was the first time that I felt a, a sense of safety in the world, being in that shelter. Um, and, and so it, it, it was kind of a natural thing that when I became a filmmaker, it was, it was, I knew it was one of the stories I had to tell and that I was the right person to tell it because I could, I could, you know, convey it from a really authentic, truthful place. Um, it's really rare for a survivor to, you know, then go and make a film about their experience. So um yeah it was around six years ago that I decided to to embark on this journey and it wasn't without my, the collaboration of my mother um you know I asked her to write a memoir to fill in the gaps of my childhood memories that was a whole six-month process and you know it's been a really cathartic healing journey for both of us and um the whole time it's been it's been really about navigating that blurry line of fiction and reality because um you know, obviously it's a piece of cinema and there's there's a point that you have to kind of, you know, make decisions of what's best for the film, what's best for the cinematic potential of the story. And so, um, you know, that that 
that fine line, that balance. Um, it, it happens throughout. I can't say exactly how much is real, how much is fiction. It's 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 quite blurry at this point. So, uh, but I would say it's emotionally autobiographical and very much um, grounded in a place of truth. The casting is phenomenal. Zara Mir Ibrahimi plays um, Shada. A lot of people know her from Holy Spider, one of the great films from last year. Uh, how did you come to know her and, and what was she able to bring to this role of Shada that impressed you? Yeah, I mean, Zara is incredible. I was so fortunate to um, come across her. I was introduced to her by Gul Shifta Farahani, a French Iranian actress um, who recommended her. And, you know, after searching all of Australia for Shada, we couldn't find her. So it was when Gold Shifter suggested Zar that I, I saw Zar's tape. And, you know, within the first 10 seconds, I knew she was it. You know, she brought a, a strength and vulnerability to the role. Uh, and it was really unmatched, like the, the nuances that she brought to to Shada, um, especially because of her own trauma and life experiences that she's had uh, being exiled from Iran. And, and uh, you know, she brought so much of her, of her own, of her own world into the, into the role. And, um, you know, I would say that she, I, in my opinion, she's one of the, the most incredible actresses working today. And, um, you know, Holy Spider was the, was the first kind of big break for her. But I, I do feel that Shada, because she's carrying the whole film, she's in every single scene and uh, she does a beautiful job of, you know, showing us all of the myriad of emotions and challenges a woman has to face in this situation, but also the lightness and the joy. Like when, when Zara smiles, it's like the whole world smiles, you know, there's, there's, um, there's such power to her vulnerability and and I'm just so proud to have worked with her and and uh yeah really really hope that the world sees sees this performance this very special performance and this young actor Selena she plays Mona the daughter at the beginning of the film I was like okay I don't know how much she's going to be in the movie but I mean <laughs> she really progresses and the emotion you can pull out of this kid is incredible. You can't find a lot of kids that can do this on screen. How did you find her? I mean, I, I feel like the universe, I asked the universe for something and uh, it's a little <laughs> bit, you know, I was very lucky, you know, um, we, we searched all of Australia for, for a six year old Farsi speaking girl, which, you know, there aren't a lot of candidates, but actually we had a hundred submissions um, all through various Persian schools that we reached out to. And Selena was, um, you know, one of the candidates in Melbourne. And as soon as she walked in the audition room, like she had a star quality, she had a charisma, a confidence, and she sat down, I gave her a situation and she cried and it wasn't without, it wasn't because I prompted her to, it was just how she felt in the situation. And then 10 minutes later, she was able to dance and sing. And so she understood acting, like she had this emotional intelligence beyond her years. She was six years old when we, cast her and, and six years old when we shot Shada. So um, for me, you know, knowing knowing her, I guess, in a genius, you know, she was born for this. Um, my, my responsibility was to protect her from the material of the film and um, to do as much as I could to ensure that she's not traumatized by the themes of the film. And, and to this day, she still doesn't really know what the film is about. You know, we, we put in so many different measures to to make sure that we could get that that incredible emotional response from her, um, but in a way, in in situations that were child friendly. Um, so you know, a lot of the time, you know, the 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 father character who's interacting with Shada, if they're having you know um, difficult words or or um, you know a physical altercation, she's not present. You know, we're shooting her shots separate. Um, or when the scenes with between him and her, um, it was about, you know, we had a double who didn't speak Farsi, who couldn't understand. So it was it was a lot of trickery, a lot of um, a lot of play. But I'm I'm you know, I'm really proud of the fact that the, her performance still speaks volumes, despite all of the challenges we had. Um, and it just speaks to it just speaks to her talent and also like the bond that she has with Zar. 
is was just undeniable from the first day that they met and and it's that mother daughter bond that mother daughter connection that is the heart of the film uh and so you know it it it, it just worked out really well in terms of the casting i'm really proud of all of the cast <laughs> And the film has been so well received um, as a film in the film community. I'm curious, you know, what is the Iranian community? What has their reaction been like? Is it mostly positive? Have you felt any backlash? Because this is not only um, a film, but it's 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 shade as emancipation from a culture that is still going on in in many ways, and and it's it's a story sort of pulling away from a lot of that. Mm. The thing that, the thing is that what she's escaping is not specific to her culture. You know, it's really it's really more about escaping patriarchy, which is universal. And, you know, in fact, the film is a celebration of Iranian culture. You know, she's actually leaning into her culture and passing it down to her daughter, um, especially the things that give her joy and strength, which is like Persian poetry and food and dance and Persian New Year. And so you know, I think there's been a really incredible response to the film for that reason, especially from the community. Um, I think there is a misconception that that a woman has to turn her back on her culture to find freedom, you know, when they're from a migrant background. Actually, she finds freedom in having agency to choose how she wants to live her life. And and that's really the the heart of the film. And that's universal. Like, it doesn't matter if it's an Iranian woman or a Vietnamese woman or an American woman. It's it's really about a woman finding finding uh, freedom from patriarchy. So, and that affects all of us. It's not specific to Iranian culture. Well, it's it's a beautiful story. And Nora, thanks for joining our panel today and good luck with the awards season and congratulations on Shada. Thank you so much. Welcome to Gold Derby. I'm senior editor Denton Davidson here with Hugh Welshman, the co-screenwriter and co-director of The Peasants, Poland's entry for Best International Feature at the 96th Academy Awards. Hugh, what was that like to receive the news that you and your wife, DKs, you've been selected as the entry from Poland? You know, what do you want to represent and how exciting is that? So it's great. First of all, apologies that DK is not here with me. Unfortunately, she had two operations in the last nine days and she wanted to be here, but she's still a bit weak. So um, I'm representing both of us today. Um, so uh, she'll forgive me if I talk for her. Um, so um, we we were we were really thrilled. I mean, you know, it's um, I think especially because ours is oil painting animation because it's animation, um, and uh, also because we had some you know very prestigious competitions. So. We, we thought it was a great um, honor to be selected. Um, and also because of the fact that this book is the, no, is it's that it's a national heritage book in Poland. So everyone has to read this book at high school. It won the Nobel prize exactly, well, uh, next year, it will be exactly 100 years um, since it won the Nobel prize for literature. Um, so it seemed like a nice anniversary for us to be going forward for the um, um, Oscar contention for best international feature. And, uh, you know, um, it's actually already gone out in cinemas in Poland and uh, we're on 1.3 million admissions in Poland. And it's the first Polish film since COVID to get over a million admissions. So um, it's exciting times for us. Well, it's animated, and the storytelling is almost like a fairy tale, like like a like a fairy tale for adults. That's that's dark and gritty. I loved it. Can you talk about this oil painting style of animation because it's so beautiful, and and give us an idea of of the time that it takes, and what's so unique about this style compared to to what we're used to seeing when we think of an animated film. Well. Oil painting is an incredibly sophisticated art form. It's been uh, honed over 500 years. Um, some of the most expensive uh, items in all of history are, are pieces of art. And most of them, I mean, I think all of the top 20 are oil paintings. So, you know, this is something incredibly 
valued in our culture and the reason it's incredibly valued is because you know it's a very sophisticated form of uh bringing over your 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 vision of the world um and you know uh what my wife um uh, she comes from a background she 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 specialized in in art when she was 14 in Poland they have this this system for specially gifted children in like music or or arts and and um or sports and so you know she she was she was painting from the age of, of 14 she loved oil painting um but she also loved film and and she wanted to kind of combine it um which has been done um before so but only in short films and when i saw what she was doing i was like well, we should try and do this as a feature film. Why not? You know, so that started the, our adventure in oil painting animation. And and the reason I wanted to do it was just because I thought it looked like nothing I'd ever seen before. Um, it just had this incredible, like, mobile um, look and, and this in, incredible, like, emotions that it, it could, could bring. And one interesting thing is that we could combine it with the performance of actors. So... You know, we could we could take the performance of an actor and then uh, paint that, repaint that, if you like, just as if like an oil painter would be looking, uh, posing a group of people and painting an oil painting. We could have actors and then we could we could paint them. So um, but on the downside, uh, so I think the upside is is you've got incredible subtlety. Um, so here back here, I've got like a painting. So this is one of the uh, actual oil paintings from the film. Um, it's one of the frames from the film. There were 40,000 uh, frames of oil painting that was done, but that doesn't mean we have 40,000 frames of oil painting because um, we're only left with, um, in this one, She she her head comes up. And so all of that would be painted on this one canvas. So here, oh my goodness me. So 747. Uh, paintings were painted on this one canvas and this is the last one um so you know and well i think that's what's uh, so fascinating and, and and part of the misconception is you have real actors you have costume designers production designers like this is acted out and then you're 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 recreating something that you've filmed and it's not a lot of people like there's there's skeptics they're like oh you did you used ai so i'm going to let you shut that down right now yeah, that's why I always bring the paintings in my bags <laughs> everywhere around the world. And and also so I can sell them, you know, I'm a traveling sales, but at heart. No, I'm joking. Um, so the um uh the thing is, is that if we could do this with a computer, we'd do it with a computer because each of those frames takes five hours per frame. Yeah. So we have 125 painters in four countries working in our painting animation workstations, which are all set up so that they're exactly the same, um, so that we can get evenness of, of lighting. And the the level of um, um, skill of the painters we needed for this film was just mind blowing. I mean, in terms of uh, 40 painters who worked on our last film, who started working on, on this film, 30 of them gave up because the style was so much harder. And so obviously we were looking at maybe doing part of it digitally painted. We were looking at maybe automating some of it. And uh, I have to say that we are absolutely HI. We are human intelligence and we are human imperfection because the thing that the AI just couldn't get its um, digital head around was the discrepancies between the painters, the impasto, um, the way that the light reflected off the off the canvas. So, um, you know, we would love to automate more of our process and, and we don't, you know, go to the, the trouble of doing a film over four years and then employing 125, you know, top level painters. And on top of that, we had a hundred digital artists who were supporting those oil painters. You know, we didn't do that if we could just like press a button. So um, and I think the fact that we, we've had such an incredible response in cinemas. Um, I mean, this film um, already is only released in one country, but it's that's our record uh, for 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 the amount of admissions that we've had in one country. So um, 
you know, people are responding to it because it doesn't look like digital fair. It doesn't look like computer fair. It doesn't look what like what they're seeing. And they, they can they can tell that, you know, so, you know, the skeptics will say, oh, you did it in a computer. But actually, people know that we didn't because that's why they're fascinated by the look. And it's still it, it, you're able to still get a performance from the, from the actors. I mean, you can feel it in their voice when they're actually going through the process. What was it like? casting this film and 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 finding just the right people to tell this story which is which it's a fascinating story um I, I mean i was i was drawn in right from the start i mean you, you can't take your eyes off this movie once you start yeah it's funny people people kind of sort of think it's going to be this 19th century costume drama you know like quite slow and it it's very fast paced there's a lot of action, a lot of, you know, a lot of fighting, a lot of conflict, a lot of passion. You know, we have dancing, we have sex, we have like um, just all the human emotions in this small village in 19th century Poland that like explode out because, you know, Jagna, um, this, this, this beautiful young woman is married off to like an old widower. And it just sets in motion this train of events and it brings out like these very raw emotions in people. And, and you have these slightly larger than life characters. And, and honestly, there was no, if we had been doing this as a live action film only, we would have um, cast exactly the same people. Um, so a lot of the, the people in our film are among the most famous actors in Poland. Uh, the only exception to that is Jagna. So the main character, we were adamant that we wanted someone that people didn't know. So actually for Camilla Arundowska, this is her um, first feature film, her, her debut role. And now she's probably the most famous actress in Poland right now. Um, but uh, we wanted someone that, that for the main role, we didn't want people to have preconceptions about that character. So we actually did um, adverts on Facebook um, we uh, invited people to send in tapes from all over the country. We had like 1,200 entries um, and, uh, you know, and Camilla ended up getting getting the role. Um, so I th in the only the other big difference is if the, if we had made this as a as a live action film, it would have been two hours and 14 minutes long. Yeah. So because, you know, um, where do I have the book no i don't so the book is that thick yeah so it's it's 42 hours as an audio book and um obviously we had to make some selections and we the the first edit that we did for this was coming in at like two and two and a half hours and we cut it down to two hours and 14 minutes and there wouldn't have been any reason for us to cut it down any further if it was a live action film because we would have kept some of the subplots, but you know, painting animation is so expensive, so time consuming that we knew that we had to get it under two hours. And so we, with tears in our eyes, we like got rid of some important subplots, if you like, but actually the film is a better film because we're very, very focused on, you know, on the story of Yagna um, uh, in a way that we wouldn't have been if, if, if we'd been, uh, didn't have that discipline from from the oil painting animation and the other thing is is that the book is actually like a painting being described so it, it fitted very well for us to make that book in painting animation it wouldn't necessarily work for another book but it worked for that book um, because it was 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 like if you go and visit that place in real life where the where the book is set you just like where's Lipsa you know because it looks nothing like what what he describes in the novel, which is like the the seasons so beautiful, the transitions between the seasons. Um, so we knew that 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 kind of heightened, uh, you know, uh, descriptiveness, that poetic descriptiveness, um, the kind of the religious mysticism that infuses the book could be brought out better in oil painting than it could if it was live action or another form of animation. Well, the hard work and the and the passion certainly paid off. Hugh, thanks for joining our panel today and good luck this award season and congratulations once again on The Peasants. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Nice to meet you. Bye.
Welcome to Gold Derby. I'm senior editor Denton Davidson here with Ilker Chatak, director and co-writer of the Teacher's Lounge, Germany's entry for best international feature at the 96th Academy Awards. Ilker, what does this mean to you to be selected to represent Germany th this year? And, you know, what do you hope to re represent for, for German cinema? Well, of course, it's a great thing. I mean, um, none of us expected this. Uh, because our film is just, uh, you know, we started out making this film as a really small film. And now all of a sudden uh, you're rep representing a whole country and also like a cultural identity of the country. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's great. But at the same time, it's a great responsibility. You know, I want to know what tormented teacher did you have growing up? Um, that inspired Car Carla or were you the bad students or <laughs> what what led you to to come up with this story and inspire <laughs> the script? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I I was no easy student, I think. <laughs> um, I was a good student, though. I always had good, good, good grades, but um, I was always up for a discussion or, you know, even a fight with the teacher and um, was a bit of a troublemaker. And um, yeah, and after school, like when you when you get a little older and you get a little milder, you you know, you, your view on the world and on your teachers um, changes uh, drastically, actually. And yeah, Johannes and I, my co-writer and I, we 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 just we just thought, hey, why aren't there any cool um, teachers' films around? Like more, most of the teachers that we know are in films, at least. In Europe, they're like, you know, worn out or, you know, and we thought, why, why can't we make a film about a good teacher who just wants the best for her students, but still does the wrong thing, maybe. And uh, that was like a, like the kickoff for that story. Well, it's, it's, it's so fascinating because it's, it starts with a school a series of school thefts. But then what's brilliant about your film is that it you like you turn it into this thriller that's just happening happening in a teacher's lounge for for over petty theft and, and the score is incredible. Um, talk about the music because the music I think really makes it really changes the, the feeling and and helps you feel like you know you're on the edge the whole time in this teacher's lounge. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the music because. Um... Marvin and I, Marvin Miller, the composer and I have been working for over 10 years. He he was actually very like he was in his early 20s and I was in my early 20s when we started out making short films together. And for a couple of years, I didn't see the guy at all. It was it was all remote, you know. I we even had this thing going on where 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 I said, okay, Marvin is a is a phantom. And um <laughs> at some project I finally got to meet him in person I went to his studio and all and so did I for this film and it was like for him this was a very I think it was a tough experience because the music is so redundant and it's so little like there are so few elements that um, I allowed him to use I said I want you to really strip yourself off of possibilities because that's been what we've done in every department as well as like in the writing process we said we, we aren't going to leave school in the in you know in for the whole image we said only certain colors you know and here I said just just certain instruments for classical instruments and he he came up with like his first suggestions were um, more diverse or, or varying the, the the thing but I wanted it to be you know much more of a neurosis and um, and he was afraid that this could be like uninspired co could come come across as uninspired you know and I said don't worry it's it'll be great and um, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm very glad that it's resonating with you because um, yeah it was a tough it was a tough, uh, tough process for him. And every element in that music, like, because it's so redundant, if you make that string, if you use that string, it needs to be perfect. And you cannot imagine how many nights and days Marvin was just spending, you know, trying to get the perfect tune and the perfect sound to it. And um, yeah, we listened to it in different theaters. We listened to it on different, you know, setups. And um, yeah, this is eventually what came out. I loved it. Um, and as I mentioned, there's a, a theories of, of thefts, but the teacher is actually a victim of theft 
And as she's trying to go about, you know, solving this, it's almost like the roles are reversed and suddenly she's the pariah. Like, like all of a sudden, like she's the one getting all the negative attention. Are Is this sort of a, like talking about society in some ways and, and where we are because the parents all have a WhatsApp group message about the teachers where they're like, they're analyzing everything they do. The kids to me, I mean, maybe this is my interpretation. They're a little coddled. Like, I feel like they're like not getting what they deserve. Um, so, it, you know, am I supposed to be feeling this way or, or, or are you just like, yeah, feel how you want to feel? No, I mean, the, the, the cool thing about good stories, I think, is that they take turns that you don't expect. And yeah. we were hoping to, to, to achieve something like that in this story where you have a teacher who's like really confident and who's like really idealistic. And all of a sudden she's like in the center of, the, of a fire, you know, of a war. And we thought it's actually, it just, you know, reflects our times where you can say a wrong word and all of a sudden you have a shitstorm around yourself or to deal with. And um, yeah, and and I mean, there were so many, so many topics that that kind of bugged us in our times, like the whole debate culture, you know, you go on the internet, on social media, everybody is, you know, at war with each other. It's not about listening to the other again uh, anymore. It's about, you know, being right and also being righteous. And, you know, we thought there is a lot of, lot of things that we can kind of implement what we see in our culture right now, today, in today's, you know, what's going on today in this film. And um, yeah, and and I mean, school is a great, great place to do that because school is kind of, you know, a miniature of a society. And um, yeah, it is, that's how, how, how this came, came along. Even one of your shots that that struck me is um, it, the security has to take out his students. And even as they're taking him away, they take him in the chair. To me, it looked like servants, like carrying a king. I mean, that's that was my interpretation. It's like these um, it's like they're very worried about, you know, disciplining children and the children sort of have the run of this school. Yeah, I mean, you know, so for those who, you know, I mean, for those who haven't seen the film, it's about like, you're talking about the kid who's like, really um, standing his ground and saying no to hierarchies. And, you know, and we thought if we if we live in a democracy today, it's because somebody at some point had to pay a price and said no to to a force that is, you know, stronger than him or her. And um, and and that's why we thought this kid deserves kind of this, you know, this image where where he can be king for a second. I want to talk about your lead actress, um, Leonie Binesh. Did I finish? Yes, Binesh. Your uh, lead actress, because she's phenomenal. I mean, she just exudes the emotion and the stress. I mean, the whole time I'm watching her, I'm like, I have my blood pressure is going up for her. What talk about casting her and and um, her performance throughout this film? Yeah. So uh, when we write a script, uh, we have the different characters, and we would always put images on the walls, and um, and you know so just for inspirational uh, matters. Uh, and but but her her image was there from the very beginning, even though we didn't know that she was gonna um, do it or if she had the time. But I wanted her from the very beginning for this role and we kind of tailored it to her because I knew, like I saw her in Michael Haneke's White Ribbon a couple of years ago and I thought she's just brilliant, you know, and she was just very, very young back then, 17 years old. And I kept track of what she was doing all the, like, you know, every film that she, she, she was starring in, she was always brilliant. Even if the films weren't that great, she was always great. And I was thinking like, why isn't she having, you know, why isn't, hasn't anybody like cast her in her lead? And when, when I asked her, she said, yes, I'm going to do it. Great. I, I like your script. I don't know what you're getting it, but I like your script, but you got to know, I don't like children. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, don't worry. I said, don't worry. I'm going to take care of the children. You just have to be their teacher. And um, turns out she did like, she she does actually have a very good communication with children. But um, yeah, I, I, you know, it was just, you know, and, and, and the thing is with Leonie, she is, she has just such a good intuition. She's so smart that you, you, me as a director, we, we barely spoke on set because there was this kind of telepathical 
thing um, where she would just make a suggestion and I would love it and I could move on, you know, and I, that's why we would wrap up early every day. And that's because of her, because she nailed it every time. Is that one of the most challenging things is, is casting children and, um, and making sure that the right, the right fit, because you have a group of them. Um, so this isn't about finding one kid. You have to find a classroom. Yes. Yes. I mean, every hand, every kid, kid in that class class is handpicked. And um, I I had like three stages of casting. In the first stage, I, I gathered like little groups of four to six. And um, the goal was to convince me, their teacher, to, to go to a Fridays for Future demonstration on, you know, on Friday to save the planet. And I'd be the nose naysayer. And they would have to convince me why it's important to, you know, go out and demonstrate and, you know, save the planet. And then in those sessions, I could very quickly see what kid is playful and what kid is, you know, comes up with arguments. We would, you know, do these in improvisations. And then I would gather those kids and put them in the classroom in the presence of cameras. And with those cameras, I would do like test shootings and then look at those test shootings in the movie theater and look at their chemistry. And then in the third step, I would have personal interviews with them and say, listen, we're making a film. Um, this is like, it's, I'm not your boss. You're not the kid, we're colleagues. And I want you to have certain work ethics. I want you to, you know, read the script. I want you to make up your mind. I want you to, you know, come up with ideas. I want you to sleep early. I want you to be aware that we're a family and we take care of each other and every, whenever, you know, we're brothers and sisters. And what I would also tell them, because some parents, as we can, as you can imagine, come sometimes come to you and they say, well, my, my child doesn't have, have any line. And I would say, no, it's, it's, there are no extras, you know, and that's what I, what I also told the production because I wanted every kid to earn the same money. So it was basically, you know, I, and, you know, so it was like, we're all on the same level. And, you know, and, and, and then in the morning, when we shoot, when we, when we were shooting the film, I would start the day with a conversation and just, you know, really talk about their, you know, dreams, their fears, their relationship to their parents, their, you know, all these things where it's more than just okay, we're here to make a movie. No, we're not there to make a movie. We're there to have an encounter. And I saw them as, as human beings and I wanted to know what, what's going on in their minds. And I think that's something that they valued and, and that's why they opened up for this film and for me and you know for, for, for all of this. And that's how I got those performances, I guess. Yeah. Fantastic performances all around. Um, and Ilka, good luck this award season and congratulations on the Teachers Lounge and thanks for joining our panel today. Thanks for having me. Welcome to Gold Derby. I am so thrilled to be hosting today's international film panel with this incredible lineup of directors. With me are J.A. Bayona with Society of the Snow representing Spain, Hugh Welshman with The Peasants representing Poland, Noura Niasari with Sheda representing Australia, and Ilker Katak with The Teacher's Lounge representing Germany. Each of you has been selected to represent your country for Best International Feature at the 96th Academy Awards. So a round of applause for that. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> you know, I'm curious for each of you, you all come from such different regions and areas. What was the film or filmmaker that had the biggest impact on you at an early age, whether it was a movie, a director, or even an actor that sort of made you see the magic in movies and, and, and made that light bulb go off in your head that maybe I want to do this one day. J.A., I'll start with you. I... I I don't know if the movie that had the biggest impact, but the first memory in my life was a shot from a movie. Uh, I was three years old and my parents took me to watch Superman. And I remember seeing Christopher Reeve flying for the first time in a cinema. I mean, and and I couldn't believe what was that. Like, like that I I I remember. It's funny how I remember that shot in my mind because it's different from the actual shot in the movie. It's a much, the, the shot that I remember is a much tighter shot. And, and, and probably it's because I was sitting, sitting 
very close to the screen. So so it, it, I, I kept that shot, that image different in my mind. But from that moment on, I was obsessed with movies. I really wanted to, to go again and again to the movies. And uh, and I don't have a, a memory of me deciding to be a, film, a filmmaker or director. I, I always wanted to be. And Nora, how about you? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, growing up in Australia uh, as an Iranian girl, uh, my my mother was always really encouraging of um, connecting with our culture. And part of that was uh, going to Brisbane Film Festival and seeing the latest um, Iranian films. So, um, you know, I think the first film that I saw in the cinema was uh, Children of Heaven by Majid Majidi, which is one of the filmmakers of the Iranian new wave. And, you know, after that, it was um, The Mirror by Jafar Panahi and Where is the Friend's House by Abbas Kiarostami. So it was really, you know, a series of films from the Iranian new wave that that sparked um, an interest in storytelling uh, and filmmaking from an early age, um, but also like a connection to culture because we were so far away from our homeland and and those films allowed me to to feel connected um, in a way that that felt really special. Hugh, what about show? Well, I watched Who Shot Liberty Valance about fifty times with my dad. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, that was probably the film I watched most when I was a kid. Um, so the, yeah, classic westerns really. Um, I think uh, Neil by Mouth, uh, the Gary Oldman film um, that he directed, his one and only direct, uh, directorial outing, really affected me. I think before that, I wanted to do like gritty documentaries. Um, so, and the fact that, you know, you had this incredibly uh, tough story and this very personal story and this just incredibly beautiful cinematography um of this area of south london which you know i mean it was shot in the 1990s and it was based on his childhood in the in the 1980s but wow i mean it's uh it's it's a grim area and they made it look so beautiful and it, i was so moved by that film that i think that was the point where i thought i want to do um, fiction films and ilker yeah, I, I, I remember um, being 15 years old, uh, being a teenager in Istanbul, where I went to school, where we lived back then. And I went to the movies and um, I saw Magnolia by Paul Thomas Anderson. And that film um, caused me to really not just look at films, but to really see them. And um, after that, I just, you know, I, I wanted to know what this movie is about and I started digging deeper and um got got you know got, got saw the body of work of 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 his back then it, it was just three films that he did but like that was 99 and I think 99 was a year with many great films such as Fight Club and um yeah um and The Matrix and that was like my movie going awakening mostly mostly US cinema I have to say though <clears throat> Raining frogs. I mean, raining frogs. Like that what sticks, is that? that'll stick with you. Yes. <laughs> um, when you're we're talking about international films, I want to talk about the ability to be seen in today's movie landscape. You know, what are some of the biggest challenges or hurdles that you have to overcome just to be recognized or even even finance? And 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 do you see any shift happening um, that makes it easier or more difficult? to be recognized in the film industry. And maybe I'll start with Nora on this one. This is your first feature. So, I mean, this is, what was your experience? Yeah, I mean, you know, we're, we're so fortunate in Australia. We do have, um, you know, government funding for, for cinema and television. Um, and I was really lucky as well that Screen Australia had supported my work, you know, through my short films and, you know, coming through as a as a young director, and um, so they were the principal investor of Shader. It wasn't easy by any means. You know, there's so many scripts and notes, and um, you know, uh, building of finance plans. And I I was I was really um, 
happy to be working with an experienced Australian producer in Vincent Sheehan, um, who headed up Porchlight Films. And, you know, it was it it was a challenge in some ways because it was a majority Farsi language speaking film. Um, and we didn't have any headline cast attached when we financed the film. And so um, I think, you know, I think part of part of the the challenge of financing the film was really, you know, allowing um, investors and, you know, distributors and partners to to believe in my vision without those things, without, you know, English language, without headline cost. And um, so it's a testament to, you know, the investors, um, 51 Fund, Screen Australia, Big Screen, um, that we were able to get this project off the ground. But honestly, it was, I, I was very fortunate. It, it, it only took around eight months to, to finance and, um, that was incredible. Uh, although the writing process took way longer, like, you know, five years. So I think, I think so much of it is about having a really, really solid script and, you know, clear vision, especially as a first time director and, uh, also having champions, um, such as Kate Blanchett, Kate Blanchett's company came on board, uh, just before we went out to market. So that also gave confidence to people, um, you know, to, to, to become a part of Shader and, and, and the journey. So, um, but yeah, it's, it is a fortunate situation in Australia and not, not all film, not all Australian films get, you know, get that kind of support and, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's a wonderful thing when they do, because, um, you know, it's very hard to get independent films off the ground anywhere in the world. Ilger, how about you? What's, what's been your experience in, in Germany and, and just being able to get your films seen? And then, I mean, this one is obviously selected and, and well-supported. Yeah. I mean, nowadays there's a lot of filmmakers around and I think the biggest challenge is to really write something profound and write something that um that is um good actually like there is a lot of like you need to stick out in a way and um it it's never easy especially like you can they they have patience with your first film and your second film but uh getting the third film done is actually the th the hardest but you know my previous films they weren't that uh successful i must say but they were always like critics like them you know but they didn't like do any big box office or anything so i was lucky being productive and writing all the time and getting my my stuff um financed and at the same time you know it's this kind of a system error that i got to make my fifth film with the teacher's lounge uh and it's you know i i i don't know it's i think it's it's just being consistent and you know keep working I think that's the that's the biggest challenge, and uh, just just like um, just like Australia, Germany has a very good um, funding uh, infrastructure. But as a, as I told you, like it's there is a lot of projects competing for that fund fundings, and um, yeah, it's mm. it's it's always a bit of a it's always a bit of a you know you need to be lucky or you need to have a really good script um, to get financed, and also like for me when I did my first two films, like my first film and then my second film, it was just coming to realize who the right partners are, who's my, who's a good producer, what actually is a good producer. These kind of things are, uh, were, were difficult in the, in the beginning for me to figure out. You, you won an Oscar, uh, for best short and you were nominated for best animated feature, uh, with loving Vincent. How does that impact? Um, what what was your life like before and after that in terms of what you were able to do? Well, you know, um, after uh, I won the Oscar, I uh, would have thought it was going to be easier. But then we decided, uh, me and my wife, as first-time directors, uh, to do um, Loving Vincent, which was the world's first fully oil-painted feature film. And everyone thought that we were mad or um, it was a vanity project. And we ended up having 113 financing meetings. It took us seven years to make the film. We moved flats 20 times during that period, like moving around um, because of financial instability. Um, so 
yeah, that was that was pretty hard to put together. And so having the Oscar didn't seem like it. I mean, it got me to meet lots of people. It was part of my filmmaking experience and got me to Poland. So that's partly the reason I I went back to Poland was because because of the Oscar. Um, I met my wife, which is, of course, the most important thing in life. Um, and then, you know, Loving Vincent, which people were very sceptical about, uh, went on to do $42 million at the box office. It was the most successful Polish film of all time at the international box office. Um, and so after that, we were like, yeah, can, how can we support you? And so for the peasants, for this one, we're like, it's going to be so much easier this time. And we uh, were very happy because, you know, we had lots of great Ukrainian painters on a Loving Vincent. And this time we thought it'd be so good if they didn't have to leave their families and they can come and work with us in Poland. So we set up a studio in Kiev, um, which uh, was fully operational for exactly two months. And then the Russians invaded and we lost our money in Ukraine. Obviously, we had to close down our studio. We had to evacuate everyone. Uh, it brought down the financing structure um, and uh, just meant that actually this film was twice as difficult to make as Loving Vincent. So I'm hoping third time lucky in terms of easiness. <laughs> But I have to say, even though Loving Vincent was had was like a difficult experience, it was always fun. You know, uh, unfortunately, this one was not fun. But uh, it's kind of uh, I always feel sometimes the subject matter you choose in the film. I don't know if you guys have had this seems to bleed out into your actual lives. And, you know, Loving Vincent was about a struggling artist whose vision kind of came to the fore and was kind of redemptive for him. And, you know, our new film is quite a lot about conflict. Um, uh, yeah, our, our experience was mired in conflict um, in many ways. So, uh, yeah, does anyone else have that? That whatever film you're making, your life seems to reflect what's in your film? Well, maybe I hope not. I, don't, I haven't seen all of your other films. Maybe, yeah, you know. Sometimes I... I yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think like you, you. Sometimes there is a hidden connection between the stuff that you're working on and the and your life, what and what's going on in your life, and yeah, there's a correlation somehow. And Jay, you've you've done smaller films, but then you've also broken through to Hollywood. You, I mean, you've done some of the some of the horror films that that we all know and love like the orphanage and then um worked on the jurassic world franchise the lord of the rings tv show so you've been on both sides of the spectrum what was what was the what was it that kicked that door down for you where you were able to to, to move on to that next level of of getting visibility and and how do you think international films are um today being recognized to me uh, it was um it was a challenge to go to go back home. I mean, I I I did the first three movies I did were finance uh, in the independent market. The second one and the third one were in English, but the first one was in Spanish. I I wanted to do this film after the second one, after the impossible. I discovered the book Society of the Snow while I was researching for the impossible. Uh, I had to shoot the impossible in English because the budget um, didn't allow to get the financing in Spanish, even though the family at the center of the story was Spanish. When we bought the rights for Society of the Snow, uh, we definitely decided that we were going to shoot in Spanish or we will never shoot it, which basically almost happened because we, 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 we it's been since 2009 that we've been trying to shoot this film in Spanish. Uh, the, the, the vendor market didn't allow us to do the film for, for, the, for the theaters. We shot it with Netflix, even though they they are bringing the 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 film to some select uh, theaters, but there's there was no other way to shoot this film in 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 a different language than in Spanish, and that's a, kind of like um, it's a shame that th there's a ceiling in the market, especially nowadays that people is a lot more used to subtitles, uh, and having as you said like a successful uh, career in Hollywood, but it was impossible to shoot this film in Spanish until Netflix arrived. Um, so I, 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 I think that the best international film in the Oscar is a very important tool to uh, allow the people to get close to these films. You know, that the, 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 I think it's, it's important that we really want to tell our stories in our language, you know, and, and, 
And in that sense, I think this category is um, is very important. And film it seems to be reaching a broader audience, even even with all the streamers. And I mean, people just have more access access to various films after they've gone through the cinema process. So, um, well, congratulations to all of you, and best of luck at the upcoming Oscar nominations. Um, I certainly hope to see all four of you named uh, when those nominations come out. But congratulations on being selected for your countries, and thanks for joining this Gold Derby International Film Panel today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye.